it. For now, I am very indifferent about it and it doesn't move anything in me. Um, I am bored. That's Scottish accent. Finish the book. I am going to make a video that is spoilery because here I'm keeping everything spoiler free. All honesty, guys, I was not planning to make this video. No. No, not at all. But a couple of days ago, I uploaded a reading vlog where I read a couple of new romanticy releases that I read in January. And this book, Has a Flame and Shadow by Sarah J. Maas, this was included in that vlog. And again, all honesty, all I expected to say in that vlog was, guys, her best book ever, <laughs> because I always give positive reviews of her books, right? There were a couple of her books, like the early Throne of Glass books that I didn't really enjoy. But other than that, I have a positive opinion about her books, right? Well, not when it comes to this book. <laughs> So I decided to expand on the vlog that was non-spoilery and make a spoiler-filled video where I basically review this book, all the good, because there were so many positive things about this book, but I'm also going to review everything that I didn't like. It is not a commentary. I am not going to, like, you know, go through everything that happens in this book. I mean, <laughs> that would be impossible. It's like a hundred chapters long. So, no, it is not a commentary, but I will be discussing spoilers. So if you have not read this book, if you have not read the other Crescent City books, and all honesty, if you haven't read the Aquatar or even the Throne of Glass series, exit out this video because this video is is not for you it's just going to ruin your reading experience which is something that i really don't want if you are here for sarah jms hate you're not gonna get it if you are here for sarah jms love you're not gonna get it what you are going to get in this video is a very objective review of this book from a person who likes her books just think that This one was not exactly the best. I do not know Sarah J. Maas, <laughs> or maybe I should say that I do not know anything about Sarah J. Maas because I only read her books, I only care for her books, I, I only care for her art, right? Nothing else really. But honestly, I am, I am so happy to see her on Instagram and on YouTube and on other media outlets, like celebrating the release of her book and celebrating her hard work and I feel that in today's world it is just so easy to bring down a successful woman and regardless of what you think of Sarah J Maas and, and, and her art nobody can deny that she is a very successful writer if nothing else like you know at least when it comes to the sales numbers she is very successful in the publishing industry and I don't want to bash her I don't want to bring her down I do not want to contribute to that so that is not something that this video aims to do but let's get back to this book so overall I feel that House of Flame and Shadow was a fine conclusion for now for the Crescent City series uh, but I have very mixed feelings when it comes to this book I will go through everything that I liked everything that I didn't like so this is gonna be one hell of a ride and <laughs> yes <laughs> pun intended in my humble opinion it was the demon daddies it was the demon daddies who made this book and more about them later for now hey Hello, how are you? Welcome back or welcome to my channel if you're new. My name is Juji, I am the petite reader and I make weekly bookish videos. And if this is something that sounds good to you and you like any of my other videos, then I think that you should definitely consider subscribing to my channel. You are welcome here. Okay, first things first, the Agatar crossover, or I should say the Nesta crossover look. I adore Nesta, so to me it was a Nesta crossover. But honestly, I still don't know how I feel about this 
crossover. Let me know your opinions. What do you think about those certain scenes and those certain chapters? Because there were so many parts that I enjoyed. And again, many parts that I didn't like at all. I enjoyed that it was Nesta and Ezreal from the Akotar world who interacted with Bryce because honestly, like when it comes to other characters, like specifically Resand and Feyre, like I don't really want to see them anymore. Yes, I know that Resand was also in this book, but he was not like, you know, such a like super important character, thanks God, because I feel like I've been overexposed <laughs> and I don't really care for Resand and Feyre anymore. I want to be with other characters and I want to get to know their stories, you know? That's the only reason, really. So I enjoyed that it was Nesta and Ezreal. I expected that it would be the Walkeries. I think that Nesta, Emery, and Gwyn and Bryce, wow, like... Honestly, yeah. I think that that, that, that would have been... could have been better. <laughs> The entire point of this crossover was, I mean, there were many points to it, really, but the main point to make this crossover was to learn about the history of the Fae, right? Both in the Akatar world, Prithian, I should say, as well as in the Crescent City books. And honestly, I like that, and I feel that it did its job. It was not perfect, and I am going to come back to that later on in the video, but I think that it did the job and, and it was fine. But Sarah James pulled there with uh, Deglin, Asteri, whatever, sleeping there in the prison for like 15,000 years without anybody knowing about it. Honestly, that surprised me. I didn't expect that to happen. And also, can I just say that I loved Bryce's exit from the Agatar world. She was like, you know what? I have what I want. I gotta go and save my planet, save my people. So yeah, fuck you. I'm just gonna go now. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Now, some people say, and I really do want to know your opinion. What do you think? Because some people say that this was just a money grab, that this was a fan service because she hasn't published an Okotar book in a long while. And some people say that, oh, this was like clearly a setup for the next Akotar books. I don't know, maybe all of this is true. Regardless, she is an excellent strategist and an excellent businesswoman. And we saw that with the extra chapters. Now, did it do much for the story? I don't know. I don't know. Ow! Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry for criticizing you. You don't have to be abusive. Okay, so now what I really liked about this book. When it comes to Sarah J. Mass, her books are my comfort reads. Whenever I feel sad or stressed or, or just in general, whenever I feel down, I open her books, I come home to her books, I spend time in her world and, and with her characters, and it is a true form of escapism for me. So, you know, I, I cannot deny that. And this book is no different. When you are in a Sarah J. Mass world, you know that you are in a Sarah J. Mass world. She has such compelling stories and worlds and characters, and this book was not different. It was super messy, but it's it's not different. It is a true Sarah J. Mass book. And I gotta give it to Sarah J. Mass that she for sure knows how to bring a story together. She did it in this book, although it was a little bit messy, but honestly, at the end, you know, everything came together and everything worked out. And reading her books is truly an experience. And if you are a Sarah J. Mass reader who read like all of her books and maybe even multiple times, then you know exactly what I mean when I say that. Reading her books the first time, that's just like scratching the surface. You gotta read the books multiple times to get every single drop of information out of there. I read, for example, the Akutar books five times, and every single time I read them, I find something that I thought was not important, was not significant, and then 
it comes back to me and then it becomes significant in the story and uh, I like it I, I like this style of writing now I loved learning about the history in the Akhtar world and how actually you know Crescent City or Midgard began I really enjoyed that section but it was not just about the history lessons. What I really liked about this section is that it was way, way, way darker than I expected. That the characters involved, the fae involved, were actually morally gray characters who were driven by greed. And um, I didn't expect that. And I actually really like that. I was also super happy to see Lydia and Rune, my favorite side characters. I mean, should I say that? No, not really, because I had many favorite side characters, but my favorite couple, I'm gonna say that. My favorite couple finally coming together in this book. I really, really enjoyed that. I needed that. <laughs> and also, and the last thing I wanna say in this section when it comes to the things that I liked is that the audiobook is excellent. I mean, I expected the audiobook to be excellent because Elizabeth Evans narrates the audiobooks and I love every single Crescent City audiobooks and it's not just about her voice, but it is also about her performance. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Okay, now let's discuss the things that I didn't necessarily like. And unfortunately, this is going to be a longer list. What I love about her books, and I've said this many times before on my channel, is not necessarily her like plot and stories and romance. I like those things, but what I really like is her characters main characters, side characters, and the character development, the character growth. I am a character-driven reader, so I am always here for that. And I think that that's where I can truly connect to Sarah J. Mass and her writing. And in this book, we didn't get any of that. I felt no connection to the characters. I felt very much removed from this book when it comes to the characters. And I want to specifically talk about Lydia's character here. And maybe this is gonna be an unpopular opinion, but Lydia, among many other characters, is, is one of my absolutely favorite characters in this book. She is the Oomph. She is a Betty. She is such a strong, resilient woman. And, and I love to see female characters in books. And, and we know that Sarah James writes like female characters like that. What really let me down in this book, because Lydia had some beautiful, very strong moments. But then when we got to know her backstory, I was so disappointed. I was like, oh, really, Sarah? Like, what's this really necessary? And that is the word that I want to use because no, that backstory, in my humble opinion, was not necessary. And it didn't do anything to Lydia's character. In a way, I think that it only took from Lydia's character. And we know that Sarah J. Mass loves including pregnancy and babies in her books, which is not a problem. It's absolutely not a problem. But it rubs me the wrong way when she uses pregnancy and babies as a plot device and as a device for character growth and character development. And that is exactly what happened with Lydia's character. I don't understand why she included the twins in the story. Women can simply realize when they do something wrong, they can tell the difference between wrong and right without being a mother, without being pregnant, without giving birth. So what was the point of making Lydia into a mother? Because if you really think about it, and of course you are free to disagree with me, but if you really think about it, if you remove her twins from the story and then you just give her a very simple backstory, like for example, oh, 
like you know what i saw all those people tortured and dead and and, and i just couldn't deal with it i just didn't want to be a part of it the story doesn't change nothing in this book changes so it was completely unnecessary to include the pregnancy and the babies and when i realized this was when we had that like final scene with Pollux. It was something that I've been looking forward to ever since Lydia and Pollux came into the picture because I knew that this scene was going to be amazing. And all I wanted is Lydia for five pages long, 10 pages long, I don't know, 20 pages long, just like bashing the hell out of Pollux. That's what I wanted. And what did I get there? Her kneeling and begging and i was like wait what's happening this scene should be between lydia and pollux the twins we do not need them rune we do not need them she used this scene to say oh lydia is my mate which was like again i'm like oh, what is where is this coming from okay i'm, I'm not understanding i'm like no we do not need the twins, we do not need room there. This is a conflict between Lydia and Pollux and she is capable to take care of him and to win over him. And I just feel that we were robbed from that scene. The scene that I anticipated so much. And to continue with Lydia and Rune a little bit, I was also disappointed that they didn't get enough screen time. No, they didn't. Not as individuals to truly work through their trauma. But also not as a couple because they were so angry with each other and they had such serious trust issues. And we do not really see them working through that at all. And also when it comes to the romantic scenes, like we got very little of that. And... I guess again it rubs me the wrong way because I really like her side characters and I remember reading Throne of Glass and I felt the same way about my two favorite couples in that series. One of them is uh, Adrian and Lysandra and then the other one is Elid and Lorcan and the romance was included and they had their moments but I wanted to see more. I wanted to know more about them as a couple but also about the individual characters and i think that was one of the reasons why i really really liked tower of dawn in that series because it focused on a completely different set of characters and they got their own book to work through their issues and to develop their relationship independently of other characters and I really like that. And honestly, I could do with a Rune and Lydia book, or at least with a novella, but we're not gonna get that, unfortunately. And as long as we are talking about couples, let me just say this, but I think I've said this before, reviewing the first two books, that I still do not feel the Hunt and Bryce chemistry. And when they said in this book that they were married, like, my brain blocked that out. I forgot that and I still don't remember that. I knew that they announced that they were like uh, mates or whatever but I, I, I forgot that they were married because I just simply do not feel that chemistry and that connection between them. So yeah, I mean this book was no different in regards to that. And can we just talk about the side characters? Because there are so many side characters in this book who had no purpose, who did absolutely nothing. I mean, maybe like a bare minimum because she had to include those characters in the book, but really, were they significant? Declan, Flynn, Juniper, Fury. And that was very disappointing to me, specifically Fury, because she is a badass. And again, I expected some really, really cool scenes, including Fury, but we never got that. And then we also had side characters who were only there for the sake of other characters and for the growth of other characters. And I know that she does this all the time. She did this in the Akutar world and again it rubbed me the wrong way and now she's doing it in this book. But when you think of the character of Sigrid, 
and Satya. Secret was there for Ethan's character arc and Satya was just randomly introduced for Therian's character arc. And I understand that she is setting up the next Crescent City book. I totally get that. But your plot is already complex and complicated. And you already have so many characters. Why do we need to add more? I feel that because of all these reasons, I was not really able to connect to the characters. And honestly, I also feel that the characters within the book, they also didn't have any true connection to each other. At least I couldn't feel it. So that's my issue when it comes to the characters. Now let's discuss the plot. We all know that when it comes to Sarah J. Mass, there are certain reoccurring themes in her books. Religious themes, um, military and war and colonization, especially in the Crescent City books and pregnancy and babies. And, um, you know, I've said this before and, and I say it again because truly this is how I feel about this, this whole situation. She is the creator and she has the right to write down anything she wants on paper and then publish it. And, and I, as the reader, have the right not to purchase it. So when I purchase her books and I, I read her books, when I read about certain themes that I don't like or I disagree with, I just roll my eyes. I, I get over it, you know. But in this book, it was hard for me to do because this book is very heavy on these themes. And it's not enough that... It, it's heavy on these themes. It's also super, super, super dark. And I feel that it can be triggering to so many people. And when you decide to use these themes, do not do them unnecessarily. When you include them, make sure that they actually need to be there in the book for the plot. And I just don't think that that was always the case in this book. Also, can we just talk about the mid-chapter point of view changes throughout this book? Well, because there are certain chapters, there are chapters that are totally seamless. And there are certain chapters when we get like even four different worlds, scenes, point of views and I understand why she did it and she's not the only one many authors do it and I genuinely understand because they want to keep the pace up and and they want to keep you turning the page and I get that but for some reason in this book it didn't work for me because by the time I got into the scene and I got into the world and I began to understand the characters and what they're doing boom suddenly we were in a different world and we were suddenly following different characters and it just resulted in, in, in a disconnection, really. The ending. Like I said, the last 25-30% I very much enjoyed, like I finished, I think I finished that section in like one read, one sitting. I, I really liked it. but. The ending was super predictable. She said herself in an interview, I believe, but again, maybe I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, that this whole like end war scene, it was, or fight scene, I should say, it was inspired by the Avengers Endgame, right? And I totally see that because when Hunt decided to become an Avenger, I was like, wait, what's happening? And I see a lot of similarities between this book and her other finale books, but specifically uh, A Court of Wings and Ruin, right? Because there are certain, again, reoccurring themes. And just to give you a couple of examples, like for example, when Bryce here asks for the help of the Princess of Hell to, to help defeat the Asteri, in Aqua War, Feyre, and Resand, and the Night Court, and the Inner Circle, they use the 
prison inmates, right? To help them out in that war. Or for example, when the sprites um, come to help Bryce out. It was very similar to me, again, in Oka War, when the Spring Court and the Autumn Court, the forces of these two courts arrived to help them out on the battlefield. And not just the Spring and the Autumn Court, but like Prince Draken. And also, like Bryce dying and then coming back, like, we had Resand dying and coming back in Aqua War. So these are just, like, you know, certain things that I picked up. So because of that, the ending was predictable, but with all honesty, <laughs> I also like that she didn't really kill, like, any of my favorite characters because <laughs> I also have separation anxiety and if she killed one of my favorite characters, I also couldn't handle that, so I'm not sure that I should really like criticize her for that decision. And in my opinion, this book was the plot-heavy book, because usually we get a lot of character work. In, uh, not in this book, it was all about plot, and again, by the end, everything came together. But I feel that overall, to get there, it was very slow, and it was also very messy. And I see sometimes fantasy writers making this mistake, in my humble opinion, that when they have a very successful series and they know that they will continue the series, then they don't just write a finale and then a setup book or a setup novella. They kind of like merge the two together and it becomes super messy. And she is not the only one. I see other authors and other publishing companies doing that and I always criticize this. I always say first publish your finale and then set up the characters. Like we can do that, there is a way to do that, you don't necessarily need to merge the two things. One of my biggest criticism in this book is that gigantic plot hole that just didn't make any sense to me, specifically when it comes to the princess of hell. Now in my humble opinion, these demon daddies, they were absolutely the characters who made this book. Like, I just absolutely love them. I love them. <laughs> but what they did, it didn't make a lot of sense. Because Aedas had all the information for Bryce. He knew everything about the history. He knew everything about what happened. He was there. And he said that he didn't tell anything to Bryce or didn't explain anything to Bryce because she wasn't ready. So he was fine with Bryce, like literally like teleporting and going into the other world, putting herself in danger because he didn't just simply tell her things. And also that whole Thunderbird story and how Hunt was created, etc. Again, I'm like, am I the only one who's like not getting it? But I understand that they created the Thunderbird and then they like projector and created Hunt, whatever. And they were just sitting around waiting for somebody's like Thea's descendant with this significant power so that they can defeat the Asteri. And when this girl is there, when Bryce is found, technically, they don't tell her anything. They don't prepare her for anything. Don't help her to understand her powers, to understand the Asteri, or to understand her, her possible role in, in Midgard, and maybe even her relationship with Hunt. Like, why did you create the Thunderbirds then? You were clearly waiting for a descendant, like... And then when she's there, you're just like... <laughs> And this is just a question. I don't really want to theorize in this video, but do you guys think that the princes of hell, they could be the walk in the Throne of Glass series? Because based on the descriptions that we got here, that they were basically just like demons disguised in a human body, isn't it the description that we got for the Wog in the Throne of Glass series? Because we didn't have all the princes of hell in this book. Is there a chance that the other princes in, in, uh, in the Throne of Glass series, the, the, the Wogs 
also had brothers, right? Like Arab one. He, he had brothers, if I record this correctly. Could this be the same thing? All right, now let's talk about the next steps because we know that there is the other book coming, which is The House of Many Waters, I think. And based on what she did in this book, we know that it is going to be Ethan and Tyrion that we will follow in those books. And I'm guessing as far as romantic relationships go, it will be Ethan and Perry, I guess. And also Tyrion and Satya. I think that's what I suspect. I don't know. What do you guys think? And as far as the Sarah J. Mess universe goes, I feel that we are getting to the point where we will discuss shapeshifters, right? The fact that Ethan has elemental powers and he is a shapeshifter and Lydia, the fact that he is a deer and he has fire, which is like super similar to aliens power and you know, there's a connection there to Terrasen. And maybe in the Akutar world, could we connect this to Temlin? Because he is basically the only like natural born shapeshifter in that world so far, right? So I'm just wondering if those are the next steps for the Sarah J. Mess universe and how she will connect everything to Throne of Glass and to Aurelia. Now, I want to mention the extra chapters because honestly I didn't read the extra chapters. I didn't get the book that had the extra chapters because I was just simply one of those readers who aggressively disagreed <laughs> with everything that happened with the extra chapters in the current economic situation. I just don't think that this was a very nice uh, thing to do and why would an extra chapter cost five dollars? I have no, no idea. So far I haven't read the extra chapters. Maybe I will read them online but I usually don't really find them very important in my opinion. But again this is just my opinion. If a chapter is very important then you know we would just include it in the actual book. To me these chapters are just fan service. It is probably a delight to read them, but I am not going to pay like a lot more money to get those extra chapters. So I cannot really say anything about the extra chapters just yet. Now, look, uh, this being all said in the video, and you know, this book not really being my favorite Sarah James book, I am still very, very, very excited for the next Akutar book. I want to spend some time with the Akutar characters, Nesta and the Valkyries and Elaine and Lucian and Azriel and Tamlin and Helian. Like I have so many theories and ideas in my mind, like where the next Akutar book is going to go. What do you think? Do you have any theories? If you do, definitely let me know in the comments down below. Oh well, <laughs> this is it guys. This is the end of the video. This is the end of my review of this absolutely beautiful mess. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you. Hit share, like and subscribe to my channel if you want to. I have a lot of very exciting projects coming up on this channel. In the meantime, if you want to check out any of my other videos, I will leave them on the screen, probably here and here. And I see you soon in an upcoming video. Bye!